how are you guys? That great graveyard shift, they say. My English is already living, but it's okay. Um, the speakers have been absolutely incredible today. I think you should give everybody a round of applause, guys. It's been amazing. And um, I think it's been so great, so incredible. I don't know what I'm, I'm doing up here. I feel like I should just go home and leave you guys. But what you need to do, if there's anything any of the speakers said that you really loved, tweet it and say it, I said it. <laughs> and then we're over, it's done, okay. Um, uh, so I just want to talk to you about, uh, my talk is called, Data Does Not Trump Our Humanity. That's my talk, but I'm sure every now and then I'll kind of rift off because I have a very short attention. Um, <laughs> uh, so, oh, uh, oh, sorry, I don't know how it got there. I should have built a wall. I should have built a wall around that guy. I don't know what he's doing there. Um, but, um, so, if you are a nerd like me, right? If you're a nerd like me, when you hear the word data, there's one thing you think about. You think about this guy, Lieutenant Commander Data of the USS Enterprise. Oh my God, you guys are nerds. Do you know who that is? Yeah, that's what I thought about. Literally, that's the first thing I thought about when I think about data. Even though I work for a company that only sells data, that's the first thing I think about. That guy, he's, he's probably my all-time Star Trek favorite character. Love the guy. And I also have another confession to make. When I was Googling to find his picture, I made, I realized that I cannot spell, even though I've got three books. And this is the evidence. Look at this. I am, um, maybe if I had drank some Woolies water, I wouldn't have been able to. I think that's the thing that I was missing here. Um, so, and um, I love what Mark Twain said. Mark Twain said that anyone who can only think of one way to spell a word obviously lacks imagination. I have no respect for a man who can spell a word only one way. So I think I'm in great company with Mark Twain. Um, so let me tell you about a guy called Alfred Kaiser Boyce. Many of you do not know Alfred Kaiser Boyce. Alfred, picture this moment that I'm about to tell you. Picture in your head. Alfred Kaiser Boyce, it's 1988. His wife of 40 years is dead. He is at the funeral of his wife. He's inside this church. And he gets up to walk up to the podium. As he approaches the podium, you can see his grief-stricken face. He is devastated. And he, st he stops next to the open casket, and he reaches into his pocket, and he takes out a letter. And he leaves the letter in the coffin. And then he touches his dead wife's hand and goes back to sit down and does not go to speak. I imagine that the data that you have in your head, all of you right now, because you sing Alfred Kaiser voice, you think Alfred Kaiser voice is a white man. You also think that Alfred Kaiser voice, because it's 1988, how can he have such a romantic gesture, but he's a black man? Alfred Kaiser voice is my grandfather. And this was when my grandmother had passed away. And he was so devastated. I remember that moment so vividly because to me, he was a strong man, you know, who never cried, that everyone was absolutely afraid of. And I always think that the data that we always use is always, we always use it to remove humanity from people. Or we use data to remove uh, what is sensible and what is right. We, we forget that actually data is also meant to enhance humanity. And... Um, let me skip that great line. So this is where I was born, and that's where I grew up. That was my home. Uh, I spent like the first 12 years of my life here. And this is Alfred Kaiser Boyce's house. Alfred Kaiser Boyce loved his livestock, his cattle. He had like, he had, he had, you were only allowed to have 30 maximum, a maximum of 30 cattle uh, back here during apartheid in the village. And he had 60 sheep, and he had about seven horses. If 
he sent any of my cousins to a neighboring village on his horse. And the horse came back sweating. Do you know what he did to the guy? He would get on, on another horse and chase this boy all the way to that village where he sent him and come back with him and you are running behind him the whole time. So my grandfather was a very strict man. And when he called my name or anybody's name, he would not say, he would summon you. He would say, Kayaletu, that's my name. And then you had to say, Dadomkulu, which is grandfather. And you ran to him. You couldn't walk. You were not allowed to jog to him. You had to run to my grandfather when he called you. And so I think that uh, one day after we were in the fells, one of these fells, we were looking after my grandfather's cattle. And around 4.30 in the afternoon, like every day we did, we bring the livestock back home, we close the, we close the crawl, and then we start, you start counting all the cows. And then we realize that one was missing. And my grandfather loves his livestock. He loved his livestock. You know where you count five times to make sure that you're, like, you, you've, you must have made a mistake? And then you start, stop counting and they start calling all of them by name, all the cows, to see to think which one you haven't mentioned. And then I realized there really is one cow missing, and I, can't go, I cannot go home and eat now. So we go, my cousin and I, we go to the village, up and down, neighboring village, until 10 o'clock looking for this cow. We're about eight years old. Eight, nine years old, and we come back at about 10 o'clock. Now, you've got to know, if you know village life, especially back then in the, in the Eastern Cape, by 7 o'clock, 7.30, Everybody is sleeping because they have, everybody has eaten, there's no television. The 7 o'clock uh, story that you listen to on radio is done. The prayers are done. Everyone is sleeping. And I kept walking up and down looking for my grandfather's cow because I knew today was my dying day if I did not bring this cow home. Eventually, 10 o'clock, I get home. I, show, I, get, I arrive, I open the gate. My grandfather is standing in the veranda. He says, my wife, Dan, Nivel up. We run to him, so we have to run to him. But my cousin and I, we're jogging, because we, we don't want to get to him first. <laughs> Nobody wants to get to him first. And he's got his whip with him. He's like, oh my God, this is truly the day we die. And then he says, and then I tell him, look, we, we're going to look for a lost cow. And he says, I don't give a damn about a freaking damn goddamn cow. What if something happened to you? Go and eat. And now go and run and eat. And here's this thing. If you're eating as a boy, you have to eat like a man. So you can't eat like this. So like you have to eat like we're eating. He's on my He's on my So we're eating very quickly and we're done. And I realized one thing. I think I'm looking back now about how I understand data. You may be wondering, what does this have anything to do with data? And it says data must be used to enhance our humanity and not eliminate it. And I think what I'd done with the data when I was looking at my grandfather was that I wanted to prove my bias about my grandfather. And the bias I wanted to prove was that my grandfather loves his cattle more than he loves me. And we do that a lot when it comes to data. We want it to prove our biases. And you may be wondering, so Kaya, what does this have? You know, what's data got to do? got to do with it, and that is to misquote Tina Turner. But what that, I'll tell you why I'm going to use an example. I used to work for a very little known company called Coca-Cola. Anybody has heard of this company? Very unknown. So I used to work for Coca-Cola. And when I worked for Coca-Cola, I decided that I needed to understand what kind of ads resonated and what ads did not work. So I went to a research agency and, and, and asked them to do some work for me. And I said, if you could go over the last 10 years, look at every single industry. So look at cars, look at banks, look at beer, look at you know, cell phones, and, and look at the common threads that made work great and the common threads that made work really terrible. What were they? A few months later, the agency comes back with a whole, and it's very, very extensive research. And what was quite interesting, that the, one of the number one things that really, when work and ad worked really well, there was food on the table. It was, it was weird, there was food, but if there was chicken, it was even better. <laughs> and the, one, the number one thing that did not work for black 
consumers was having an animal in the ad. If there was an animal in the ad, the evidence was irrefutable. You couldn't deny it. It was very clear. And so the very first Jericho campaign, a few months later, you know, I briefed my agency uh, at the time. They come back with this fantastic ad that I love. Does not have a dog. <laughs> beautiful, and I love this ad. It's got a dog, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. But this is such a lovely ad. It's such a beautiful ad. It's fantastic. I love it. And then I said, okay, guys, let's go and present this to everybody back at, at, the, uh, at Coke. And I'm hoping no one remembers the research. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping nobody's going to remember it. And they go there, and they present this ad, and I'm laughing, ha, 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 you know, kind of telegraphing so that everybody else <laughs> likes the ads along with me. And then what happens is that now the, everybody looks at me, my boss, and they turn to me, they say, so this is the ad you're saying you are buying? It's like, yeah, it, it's an amazing ad. But don't you remember that the research that you commissioned a few months ago said that black people don't like animals in their ads. And I said, yes, this is true. But you think it's going to, I said, I think it's absolutely going to work. And the question was, why do I think it's going to work? And I said, the difference here is that what the research agency didn't do was that they stopped at the data. They did not try to understand why the data was saying what it was saying. And I said, if you look at all the ads that didn't work with animals, it's because you had an animal in the house, being treated like a freaking human being. <laughs> it's in, in your bed. It's sitting in your couch. You're not going to see a dog in the township in your house, in the couch doing that. And again, it's licking your face. Ew. Ah. In the township, dogs are supposed to be outside and they have a job to do. And they walk outside. That's what they're doing. That's what they do. And I saw the difference with this particular dog is that it's doing what a dog is supposed to do. It's walking outside. You know, it's, it's just out there outside. And although the difference with this particular dog was that it could read. But that's, <laughs> that's besides the point, you know. <laughs> so this dog could read. It, you know, I was looking for its name on all sorts of coke cans. I'm not going to show the ad because it's delayed time. You can, YouTube, you know it. Yeah, you know it. Um, so... Now, to the credit of my boss at the time, she says, I am going to trust you. Go ahead and shoot this ad. And I get the biggest budget I've ever had in my life. The responsibility on my shoulder at this point, I was like, oh my goodness, I think I'm going to destroy an incredible campaign. I have all sorts of self-doubt while I'm looking at this. I take the ad to the research agency because you can't fly an ad without taking it through the research. Take it to research. And the research agency, oh my, it's going to fail dismally. It's just not going to work. Don't you remember the, document, the research you asked for that said no animals in ads? And I'm like, guys, it's okay. Just do your job. <laughs> I'll do mine. <laughs> so they come back with the research. I have never seen research people so happy in my entire life. They are, it's like they made the ad themselves. They're like, oh, you know, the likability scores are through the roof. We've never seen numbers like this. It's incredible. It's, nah, nah, nah. it's the best ad we've ever tested, ever, ever, ever in our history. And they, they start going to, they look at, um, at what ads that Coca-Cola had done over the last 12 years, like 6,000 worldwide, and it's like, it's in the top 2% best performing ever of all time. It's like they, literally like they made the ad. And so the point I'm making here is that if you had the wrong people in the room, that ad would have been kicked out because they would have looked at the data and they said, this is what the data says, without understanding why. And I feel that a lot of marketers do not try to go beyond the facts that the data says. I think, I don't know if it's laziness or it's just a matter of trying to protect ourselves. And basically, uh, that, was, <laughs> that, was, that, that was a dog. Um, but basically, this dog, by the way, guys, this dog, we got it from Hollywood. We couldn't find a dog that could perform in South Africa. And I kid you not. I kid you not. I kid you not. And, but it's also a prima donna, and the reason is because it's licking my face. It's that if you don't let me lick your face, I'll go to my trailer. I can't work like this. Um, 
So that's how we have that picture. I am not, I hadn't discovered wool is water then, even then, so. Um, so like I said, data must be used to enhance creativity, not to police it, nor to inhibit it. And I think that's what we use the data for, a lot of um, marketers. And also, I find this to be very true, that intuition is often logic your mind hasn't told you yet. You don't know that you have already worked it out. And I think for me, what I made the defense is because in my mind I'd worked it out, but I didn't have proof. My intuition told me something, but then I had to be trusted to make the work happen in order to get the results that we, that we got. Unfortunately, way too many marketers uh, mistake fear-based decision-making for data decision-making. So they say, the data say this, but because it's mostly because they're scared and they don't want to venture out and do anything that will kind of, you know, and, and I feel in order, I think, most of the work that I remember, most of the work that I love, most of the work that I enjoy, always upsets something that, that we've always known. It always does something a little bit different. And, and funny enough, <laughs> what we did a few years later is that I think for about two more campaigns, we had dogs and ads after that <laughs> because, because of that. Because there was an understanding now why it is okay to have animals and ads. Um, and I also think, you know, if you have, if you only have people who look like you, you have people of the same accent as you, you have people who went to the same school as you did, you are not going to be able to make the best decisions. Had I not been in this room that day, I don't think that decision would have been made. Had I not been in the room. But not only that, it is also not enough just to have diverse people in the room, but you should, they should be able to make the decisions. And I think that is a very important thing that we, I think as an industry, need to start taking a lot more seriously about the people in the room. And, and I also think besides the people in the room, is that when you're in the room and the other people are not in it, you've got to think about who is not in the room. Because this is, these mistakes here happen because we are not thinking about who is not in the room. And I think a person like me, who grew up in a village, who, grew, who also grew up in a township and happened to go to a white school and then started working in a white environment, is that I don't have to be taught white behavior, what white people like, because all my life I've grown knowing it. And I think what needs to happen is that our fellow white marketeers have got to have a way of ingr like ingraining yourself in the market, and I'm not talking about in the market, I'm not talking about you going like on, on trade visit, that's not going to, that is not understanding your market. I'm not saying that you go like, uh, you know, I don't know, you trade visit and then your research agency tells you, okay, be, black people like this or black diamond research, that is not understanding your market. You've got to live in their lives. Oh, good grief, I have a minute. Um, so, um, what I'm saying is that you've got to know your data but you've got to be human. And that for me is the most important thing that marketers need to understand at this day and age. Um, and that is my time, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, but uh, thank you so much for listening to me. And Pepe, loved your book. You're an amazing guy. And thank you for staying to listen to me. Now you can go home. <laughs> no, I'm in here, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>